Here we have Kevin Blackestone. Thank you so much for being with us here at Ohio State. Sure. I know you're on behalf of this Sports and Society Initiative. Mm -hmm. And the topic today is athletic compliance. First question I want to ask you is, what? how do you define athletic compliance and how does it correlate as far as with the student athletes? Um, well, I'll give you two answers. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I started covering sports in the early 1990s and people talked about compliance in terms of college athletics, it generally meant <clears throat> making sure that um, the athletes were uh, meeting grade requirements, um, they weren't being induced uh, with some other arrangements outside of college, um, to participate. Um, it meant keeping track of things like practice hours and making sure that all the practices were uh, in accordance with NCAA guidelines, <clears throat> which I think now is a booklet that's about 400 pages <laughs> long, right? Um, but I've long since moved away from that concern of compliance. And so now I think the most important issue when it comes to compliance is whether or not the college athletic model, particularly as it relates to the laborers who are the athletes, complies with our moral and ethical standards. And what I'll probably argue today, um, which I've been arguing for 20 years now, is that it doesn't and it needs to be fixed. Right. And I know a, a strong topic across the nation is and it's been like this for the past couple of years, is that the pay for play for student mm -hmm. athletes. Um, just wanted to know, what are your thoughts on the whole conversation of the pay for play? I know California just introduced a new law right. that they're putting in place for 2023. And Ohio State is in a conversation of potentially growing that, that whole thing to where athletes can now profit off of their name, image, and likeliness. What are your thoughts on it? And, and is it something that should be fixed and can it be fixed? Um. It should be fixed, it can be fixed, um, but it is really one part of an entire situation um, that needs to be fixed. Uh, I've tried to get away from arguing about pay for play because people get caught up into numbers. Um, but basically what we're talking about here is that college athletes need a fairer share of the pie and a fair share of uh, a fair share of how they are taken care of within this system. So it's not just about sharing in uh, the um, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue that football and men's basketball um, generate. It's also about providing workers' compensation um, because you just don't get CTE once you get to the NFL. You can get CTE in college. You can get CTE in high school. Um, it's about um, providing long-term health care. Um, you look at Todd Gurley right now, who has an arthritic left knee, a knee that was torn apart when he was a running back at the University of Georgia. Um, it's about protection of scholarships. Uh, there's no reason that an athlete who becomes injured um, and can no longer play should lose his or her uh, athletic scholarship um, because really this is an academic institution and uh, athletics should be answering to, ac to, the, ac to the academy mm -hmm. um, uh, and not be running everything on its own. So um, the pay for play issue is just one part of a, a, bigger, a bigger, bigger story. Right, and then they also say that it's the NCAA is arguing that it's going to be a compromise of um, just the whole college game and how the love for the game and, and the integrity of the game. Is, do you believe that's true? No, not at all. I mean, I think the integrity of the game is compromised right now by the um, inequities that we have in terms of its economic structure. Um, and I don't think that Ohio State fans will be any less fanatic about the Buckeyes um, if the quarterback is now salaried um, and uh, treated as an employee of the university 
um, which I argue they should be, um, rather than just being remunerated uh, with room, tuition, board, and um, uh, a little bit of a stipend. Uh, I, I don't think that's going to change the fanaticism of, of fans. All right. So just to give a little bit of background on yourself, you attended Northwestern University. Correct. And then for your master's, you attended Boston University. Right. Um, what was your journey like as a student who was once pursuing journalism? Um, did you come across any like difficulties maybe throughout your later years in college trying to figure out how to get your foot into the door and what was your path like to mm -hmm. your first job? Um, <clears throat> well, I knew early on when I was in high school that I wanted to be a journalist um, because I grew up uh, enamored with the political atmosphere uh, in this country that you are now experiencing all these years later. I'm a Watergate baby. And when Richard Nixon was facing possible impeachment, um, I was glued to the television every afternoon, watching the Watergate hearings, reading, devouring everything I could in the, in the local newspapers, watching all the broadcasts. Um, and that really inspired me to want to uh, pursue journalism. And once I um, got to Northwestern, uh, I worked everywhere I could. I got internships. Um, and so by the time I was uh, about to graduate, um, I was fortunate. I had my choice of where I was going to go work because I had a pile of clips and I'd gotten to know a lot of people and um, I had a few different offers. And uh, so I always tell people in school now, you know, work as hard as you can, um, get those internships because they're critical, uh, get your reels, uh, get your clips. Um, as you meet people along the way, get to know them uh, as best you can. Um, keep your eyes and ears open, keep your mouth closed, uh, and absorb as much as you can. And um, don't take no for an answer when you're looking for your first job. That's just a speed bump on the way to whatever you're, you're going to get. And uh, grind. You, you, early on, you've just got to, uh, you've got to grind. And, um, don't believe the hype <clears throat> right now about, uh, depending on what track you're on, um, about newspapers dying and the impact on journalism. Um, information is the most precious commodity on the planet Earth. Um, and there are more platforms for distributing information right now than ever before. Um, and as such, there is a greater demand now than ever before for people to um, mine that content so it can be distributed. And the people who do best at mining that are people who are trained as journalists. Right. So out of college, I believe your first job was with the Boston Globe. Yep. Um, what was that transition like for you, life after college? Did you have like, <laughs> a first like, strong life lesson that you've learned? throughout your first career with the Boston Globe? Um, you know, it was pretty smooth. Uh, the Boston Globe is a good example of what I just said. Uh, I was, a, I was fortunate, fortunate enough to get an internship at the Boston Globe um, the summer between my junior and senior year. And uh, they liked the job that I did and offered me a job out of college. Um, it was great. It's a great newspaper. Uh, it was a, a fun city for a young journalist because it, it was a, such a young city because of um, because of all the colleges and universities right in the Boston area. Um, was a, I was a news reporter. I wasn't a sports writer. I really wasn't interested in doing sports. Um, and it was a good time. And I learned under some really uh, good people like uh, Eileen McNamara. She was, she was a mentor of mine. And at the time, she was a reporter. And she went on to win a Pulitzer Prize as a columnist and uh, was the one who seeded the, uh, uh, the story Spotlight, uh, which became an um, uh, Oscar-winning uh, movie a few years ago uh, about the investigation into um, uh, the Catholic Church's um, uh, child abuse uh, scandal um, in the Boston diocese, uh, archdiocese. So, <clears throat> you know, I just learned, you know. It was great. I mean, I'm sure I learned some things not to do along the way. Um, 
but I just file those away and try not to do them. Uh, and, but, you know, that's, you train to be a journalist, and once you get to do it and you're not in school anymore, it's just, you just live it, you breathe it. Um, you know, journalism, to me, I think, is a calling. Uh, uh, you're never off the clock. Your antennae are always up. Uh, you see things critically, um, whether it's covering a football game or going to a concert or sitting at home watching TV or listening to something on your, uh, on your uh, whatever digital player you've got, right? Yeah. I mean, we just see things differently as journalists. So, um, I, yeah, it was, it was great. The only transition was I wasn't doing schoolwork. Right. Yeah. And you say you started off doing news at first, right? Mm -hmm. And then it just kind of happened to where you started doing sports. What was that like? Well, I started, I, I did news and then I, um, I did investigative journalism and then I did financial journalism and then I got an offer to do sports. Um, and it was an easy transition because I like sports. It's a difficult transition because one thing that sports uh, reporters bring to sports is this encyclopedic historical knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. And I didn't really have that. And I, don't, I don't even know that I have it now. Um, peop, some people would other, argue otherwise because I bring up these random facts about something that happened in 1966, right? But um, so there was a, a learning curve uh, f for that. Um, which, which is a little bit different. You can't go anywhere and just learn that. You just have to pick it up. Whereas when I went from covering news to being a, uh, an, uh, to covering the economy, um, I actually went to a couple of, um, uh, a couple of mm, programs, one at Wharton at Penn University of Pennsylvania and another one at the University of Missouri, um, that aided um, people who just covered um, economics. So, but there's none of that for sports. So I had to, you know, you make adjustments a little bit different. Um, uh, but it's been a blast. I mean, covering sports is, you know, it's fun. It's fun, right. And it's important. And then you also had another adjustment when you made your way on to broadcast and TV. I know mm -hmm. that you're a panelist with Around the Horn. Right. Was that different for you? Like, was that something that you just kind of had to adjust and pick up the pace to? Yeah, that was com completely different. Um, oddly enough, though, I had been on television since my senior year in college because I used to, my senior year in college, I spent a lot of time, well, I had a, I had a job at an at a investigative newsletter called The Chicago Reporter. And uh, it was a monthly publication. And uh, the stories we turned out were deep digs into things in, Chicago dealing with race and and um, uh, social inequities um, and we also had a tie-in with a television show and so when we would produce our stories we would go on this show and they would interview us about our, our story so I'd already been in front of a television camera so it wasn't that shocking or stunning to me um, but I'd never been on an entertainment show with this crazy setup. Nobody had, because this right. was the first time somebody had put this together. Yeah. And uh, I thought it was one of the worst things that television ever produced. <laughs> I said, this is not going to last long. And next thing you know, we're, here we are. I don't know how many years we've been doing it now. Fifth, let's see, 15, 16 years, 17 great. years. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Since maybe before you all were born. I don't yeah. know. Um, and it's great, um, because uh, not only is it fun, um, not only does it uh, uh, help you uh, as a journalist in the field because you can go into any clubhouse or locker room and people know you. You don't have to introduce yourself and explain why you're there. Um, but uh, because of all the work that is put into the show on a daily basis, it also provides you with great research for topical issues that, um, that are on people's minds. Uh, so it's really a help all the way around. And did you ever have a moment of, I made it? Like, because I know you're on TV a lot, so 
a lot of people yeah. know you. Like you said, when you go into locker rooms, you're not having to introduce yourself anymore. People automatically know who you are, right? Because of your image. You yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I mean, you know, I think I, I think I made it when I got my first job out of college, right? I mean, I didn't aspire to be on television. I didn't aspire to be on radio. I've done radio shows. This is just something that happened. Um, uh, but I made it when I, I got hired out of college. Because uh, the reason I went to college to is to be get, be get, a, get a job as a journalist um, and to be able to do that for a career. And here I am, I graduated in 1981, and here I am all these years later, still working at it, done a lot of things, been around the world, been around the country, um, and still doing it, and it's great. And now you're at the University of Maryland where you yeah. teach as a professor. Yeah. What classes do you teach, and, and how different of a career is that than being a journalist and being on broadcasting? So I've been doing that about um, 10 years, and this is much like around the horn, and something kind of fell out the sky. Somebody asked me, I said no, they talked me into it, and I said okay. Then I had to figure out, well, how do you teach? How do you put together a syllabus? How do you, how do you manage the class? Um, what are the classes gonna be? Um, so I teach two courses. Um, in the spring, I teach uh, sports reporting and writing, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, uh, I teach the basics of, the very basics of sports reporting. Um, and then I kick people out of the classroom to go cover events. We cover um, high school events, college events, and pro events. Um, uh, and we do some other things in terms of critical thinking about what it is we're actually doing. Um, and I also have some guests guests come in uh, to talk about specific things in sports journalism. Um, and that's what we do. Uh, and in the fall, <clears throat> I teach a, a course that I designed um, a few years ago called uh, Sports Protest in Media. And what that is is a, it's a basically a survey of protests in sports because I want to point out to people that Colin Kaepernick was not the first. Right. That we can go back to the um, uh, to the nineteenth century and find protest in sports. Um, secondly, why is it we have protest in sports? And I try and point out that sports, for a lot of reasons, is a perfect platform, a perfect petri dish um, for protest to develop. And third, um, I like to point out to people that since we're in a journalism school, the media's role in covering these things and how the media can give uh, uh, spotlight to issues, can also confuse issues, um, which it did in, with Colin Kaepernick. When, you came up with, when, people, when we came up with phrases like anthem protest, mm -hmm. which had nothing to do with what his protest was about. Um, <clears throat> And just the importance in reporting these things accurately. Um, uh, and it's a lot of fun, so we do and that. Do you think that athletes should use their platform that they have while they have it to speak out on social, social issues um, as they come up? I know LeBron now has his I'm More Than an Athlete campaign that right. he uses. Is that important? And do you think maybe all athletes with the large platform should use it or just specifically the guys who strongly believe it? I believe that all of us, athletes, your sisters in the medical field, all of us sitting at this table, uh, all, your, all your boys on campus, I think that we as citizens in a democracy should use our platform as citizens to protest for and against things that um, are critical. Right. And uh, in that regard, um, you know, athletes get held to a certain, uh, getting held to a different expectation, um, which I don't necessarily think is, is fair. Um, but if they want to do that, great. And some don't, and I, I don't have a problem with, with that either. Um, uh, but I think that's a responsibility of all of us if we're in a democracy. Absolutely. And just to go back to the 
NCAA's initiative on the pay for play. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that schools that are in bigger markets, such as California or Florida, will have an advantage over schools that aren't in such a big market as far as recruiting goes, and it'll affect the high school game? I don't think so, because um, there are those schools have advantages now. Right. Ohio State uh, has a huge advantage over just about any college in the country because it's so large. Um, there's so much money within its athletic program. Um, it has facilities for athletes and services for athletes that other schools don't have because they can't afford it. Right. Um, if you go not too far from here to, let's say, um, uh, Miami of Ohio, where I was at not too long ago speaking, um, you know, they can't compete with Ohio State. It's a fine university, right. but they, they can't compete for recruits, you know, for a top-notch recruit. Um, or if you certainly go to a historically black college or university, they can't compete. Right. So we already have that, that um, competitive uh, uh, imbalance due to the girth of universities and the, and the finances that they have. It's not going to change because of this. And I know you've seen the whole transfer portal thing in college athletics become mm -hmm. a big thing. Um, even here at Ohio State, our quarterback Justin Fields transferred from Georgia. Right. Do you think student athletes should just be given the right to have immediate eligibility if they do decide to transfer? Or is that, do you think it's okay the way it's going as right now? I think that as long as we're going to call them, as long as we're going to um, regurgitate this phrase, student athlete, um, which was created by um, the architect of the modern NCAA, Walter Byers, who admitted it in a book that he wrote, his memoir, which is called, um, uh, now I forget the name of it, but uh, the subtitle of it is The Exploitation of the College Athlete, um, then we should not treat a college football player any differently than we should treat you. Um, or even better, you, because you're a freshman, and if next year you want to transfer, you can do so with no problem. So why should a freshman football player have a problem? The reason he has a problem is because that football player is ostensibly more important to the university than you are because he brings in revenue. Um, and so his, his life is basically run by the athletic department. Uh, I think that's, um, that's another extremely unfair restriction um, on the agency of a student just because he or she is an athlete. And I have friends who are coaches and athletic directors. I know, I know their whole argument about it. Um, uh, but, sure, um, but, um, you know, if you're going to impose restrictions on their free agency, then let's reward them with the uh, economic and well-being um, gifts that are part of a professional system because that's what you're doing right so don't tell me this is an amateur system and impose professional rules on them it's either one or the other make up your mind true and lastly just as a little fun question to give you um mm -hmm. who do you think will have a better season this year in the nba the lakers or the clippers oh the Why? clippers really? oh yeah the clippers i mean already the lakers are i mean look lebron james is the greatest basketball player of your generation there's no question about it. True. Um, and I, I've become a LeBron uh, fan. And the only reason I didn't like him in the beginning was because when he was at Cleveland, he was eliminating my hometown Wizards from the playoffs <laughs> um, uh, year, year in and year out. Um, but he doesn't have as good of a surrounding cast. I'll, I'll take what the Clipper. I mean, obviously he's got – Obviously, he's got arguably the second best player or most prolific player in the league next to him. You could argue that in AD. Right. Um, but I think after you saw what Kawhi Leonard did with Toronto, um, 
you put him in a mix with George. I'm trying to think who else they have on the team right now. Uh, Lou Williams. Yeah, I mean, it's... I, team. It's a well-rounded team, and they're, they're not coming from as far back as are the Lakers, right? I mean, the Lakers have not been very good for very long, for a long time. So, no, right now, right now it's the, uh, it's the Clippers. And, you know, LeBron's got to stay healthy, um, but maybe load management will help him. But they don't have the luxury of giving him load management, right? They don't have, you know, they don't have, any, don't have anybody they can really rest on. Um, so, no, the Clippers are the team to beat. And if the season ended in the today Lakers. in college football, who are your four teams in the college football playoffs? Uh, right now, um, Auburn has the best strength of schedule of the undefeated teams. Um, uh, better than LSU? Yeah, I think if you look at the SOS right now, I think they're better than LSU. Um, so I, I got to have Auburn in there. Um, I'm not ready to kick Clemson out, um, which is probably unfair because I'm saying that only because they're the returning champions. But they're probably not playing as – they're probably in the top seven. Uh, Alabama's got to be in there because they're killing people right now. Um, Ohio State should be in there because they're killing people right now. Uh, how many is that? Is that four? four. That's four. Yeah. But, you know, it's all going to – yeah. Alabama and Ohio State? Yeah. Yeah, I would say that right now. Although, if you ask me tomorrow, I'll probably change my mind. Because <laughs> LSU is playing really well. Um, but they just put up 66 on Vandy. Um, you know, the SEC is going to prove itself. Right. Um, it's the battle at the end. Right, it's the battle at the end. Uh, and the Big Ten will prove itself. Mm -hmm. um, I think with, uh, with Ohio State, with you, you folks, uh, Penn State, and Wisconsin. Um, and then you know, and then Oklahoma's out there. I mean, Oklahoma's going to continue to put up, put up big numbers. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, there's nobody on the West Coast. Obviously, the Pac-12 is a joke. Um, yeah, I would say I, I would say those are the, those are the teams in the mix. Do you think they should extend the, the college football playoffs, or is it good where it's at for? Well. Okay, so I will answer this just as a fan. Okay. Yes, expand it. But now I've got to go back to polemics as a critic, right? I cannot support an expansion of the playoffs until you fix the economic structure of the game. Un unless and until the athletes are going to, are going to profit financially um, as well as with uh, health care coverage, because uh, that's an extra game for them. That um, is true. I absolutely can't support it. Right. You know, will it happen? Of course, it will happen because somebody will come up with the money. Just you know, money. right? I mean, just a few years ago, they said there's no way we're doing a playoff. Then ESPN said, here's a pot of money just for the playoffs, and they said, okay, we'll do it. <laughs> and they said, no way we're going, no way we're going to expand it. And the contract was redone. How about four teams? Here's some more money. Okay, we'll do it. So will it go to will it go to six? Will it go to eight? Of course it will, as long as the money keeps so pouring in. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Blackstone. That is all for today. I appreciate you coming out to Ohio State, and I know you're going to go speak with the Sports and Society Initiative. Yeah. Um, and we look forward to. It, so I appreciate you coming out. Thank you. Thank you so appreciate much. Appreciate you.